I feel like I need to acknowledge something right at the start about my novel, We Contain Multitudes, um, which is that it has something profoundly weird about it, the book does. It's a contemporary story with teenaged characters, and yet there's no texting in the book at all. There's no Instagram, there's no TikTok, no Discord, there's no phones in the book pretty much at all, period. Um, and instead, it features letter, letter writing, letters. Um, the whole book is comprised of letters between two main characters, letters written by hand in envelopes posted in a mailbox. Well, it's, they're posted in a mailbox at their school and the mailbox is monitored by their English teacher who is the reason they're writing letters because she has randomly paired up her, um, her junior students with her senior English students in a pen pal assignment for the semester. That's the sort of, um, origin reason for the book being composed in letters. This is incredibly unrealistic that two people would write letters to the extent that these two characters write letters, nowadays anyway. It's deliberately, blatantly unrealistic and yet the book asks readers to believe in it, to accept this artificial narrative form, to suspend their disbelief that a whole plot could unfold through the writing of letters that a whole relationship could develop and blossom and run its course in this archaic, anachronistic format. But in fact, this is what drove me to write this book in the first place, an interest in the possibilities of the epistolary form. It was a writer's dare to herself. How much of a story could I cram into the space of the letters between just two individuals? Will the story be able to develop and unfurl without any additional narrator looking in on the two main characters from the outside? No point of view from any additional characters around them for context or perspective. And since this was my personal starting point for the challenge of writing this book, I've also made it my starting point for tonight as well. I'd like to share with you where my personal interest in letter writing comes from. And I'd like to investigate the epistolary form a little bit, the writing and reading of letters, as a literary form, a formal literary device, but also as a forum for self-expression and even more for self-creation. The exchange of letters can be seen as a dynamic and imaginative activity that crafts and buttresses a sense of self as well as forging relationships among people. So I've decided to title this talk, Every Novel is a Love Letter. Just to take a step back for a moment to the definition of what I mean by epistolarity. Some of us may still, once in a while, as in the discussion, pick up a pen and write a letter or a postcard to someone we care about, maybe a holiday card once a year. How many of you did uh, have a memory of writing a letter at some point recently? Everyone had? something, yeah. Okay, show of hands, how many of you have an ongoing regular correspondence with someone via snail mail with a pen pal of some kind? One? That's actually amazing. <laughs> often it's like nobody. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often anymore. But whether we consider ourselves epistolarians or not, much of what we do at work and in our social networks involves writing to people in their absence, which is the basic definition of, epistola of the epistolary gesture. And this is arguably truer today than ever, as many of us are tethered to our email accounts at work and increasingly turn to texting, blogging, posting on social media platforms, and other new channels of written communication with each other. I engage in a whole mix of what I just said, all those different forms for work and for pleasure. I have an aunt with whom I've exchanged handwritten letters for decades now, and uh, her arthritis is at, in her hands is at the stage where I will write four or five letters over the course of a few months or maybe six months for every one sort of cramped, shaky, <laughs> short reply that I get from her um, in response, but it, it really has been probably three decades now that we've been exchanging letters. The latest thing I've got going, is kind of something new for me in the last year or so, um, 
I have a good friend in Sweden who's in a different time zone, and I also have a good friend who lives in the same city as me in Toronto, but she has a young child, and so being able to talk on the phone with any kind of predictability is, is very difficult for her. And so what we've developed, and this is me individually with each of these two friends, is something that I think of as voice letters, which are quite long voice messages to each other recorded in Signal or WhatsApp. They have a little microphone icon that you can hold down and lock. And then you, when you're out for a walk or you're waking up in the morning and you have sometimes five minutes, sometimes 12 or 15 minutes, record just a kind of a really rambling, casual message about what you've been up to and what, what's on your mind and responding to some of the things that my friend said last time she left one. And then she can listen to it when she has time and she's at her leisure. And then a couple days later or a week later, she can respond with one of those long rambly voice letters um, back to me, responding to in, very much in the same structure of the old fashioned letter writing relationships where you respond to things that the person has said in their letter and then catch the, catch the other person up. So does anyone else ever do this? Leave long, <laughs> okay, one person, two. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, eh? That, there's not really a, a name for it, I don't think, or at least I haven't heard of, you know, BuzzFeed telling me what it's called that I'm doing, but it's, uh, it's replacing a kind of a, it's in the same spirit as letter writing, I think. Much different from a phone conversation or texting. Of course, the shift in medium from pen to paper, pen and paper to keyboard and phone screen, raises all sorts of questions about what such material changes mean for the relationship between writer and reader, especially when our exchanges, our so-called data, are being tracked and mined by corporations for advertising purposes and other kinds of profiteering. But that's a topic beyond my scope, a topic for another First Wednesday talk sometime. I am an English professor by training and by employment. And so for me, there's always a temptation with any new subject to submerge into, or maybe retreat into academic research and scholarly argumentation. And so I could focus on the history of the epistolary form in fiction and tell you about how 18th century novelists, beginning with Samuel Richardson, popularized the epistolary genre in fiction. Richardson's novel, Pamela, which is about this fat, <laughs> is told through a series of letters written by the titular character to her parents. And his even bigger novel, Clarissa, is, uh, features two letter writers, Clarissa and her rakish love interest, whose name is Lovelace. Writing their stories in letters gave early novelists the opportunity to convey the the inner thoughts of their main characters and capture something about their way of speaking or writing in a format with which readers were already familiar in, at that time in the 18th century because people were reading and writing letters to each other long before they were reading novels and the novel was a new form back then. Eventually, other conventions of realism took over in the novel and we got, readers got used to the first person confessional um, narrative voice, for example, in Daniel Defoe's fiction like Moll Flanders and Robinson Crusoe. And then later, a little bit later in the 19th century, uh, if you think of George Eliot and Dickens, the omniscient narrator, the third person narrator who could sort of see into the minds of various characters and describe their motivations and their foibles and comment on their actions sort of from the outside in that way. Or I could tell you about various scholarly theories of the epistolary form. For instance, there's a rich and fascinating feminist history of letter writing among women. Letters filled a gap in the education of women when women weren't admitted to universities. So a middle-class European woman's correspondence with her mentors and her tutors stood in for formal education. And similarly, women's epistolary networks served as vital circulatory systems of knowledge and analysis among women when women were excluded from institutions, like for example, the Royal Society, um, and also discouraged from engaging in conversation at social gatherings that was considered too heavy or intellectual for, to be appropriate for women. So they would do their thinking in letters with each other. For other historically marginalized and oppressed groups, for example, LGBTQ plus folks, the exchange of letters operates as a mode of risky, can operate as a mode of risky disclosure and transgression. 
And there's a whole body of scholarly work out there on the erotics of queer epistolarity in different historical and contemporary contexts. But I've decided to resist the academic temptation, except for that little digression, and I'm calling this Every Novel is a Love Letter, and so I'd like to take you on a little tour of five love letters from my past, from my life, and along the way, I might touch on some of the ways each of these letters changed me and became part of what nudged me along my path to becoming a writer. And I might touch on the erotics of epistolarity as a narrative form as well, or at least on how the energy between two people writing letters can translate into the energy that exists between a writer and a reader through a novel. So, story of five love letters. Letter number one. This is the first and only letter that I ever wrote to a writer that I admired. I was 11 years old at the time. And the author was Laurie B. Clifford, who wrote my favorite book, uh, which was called Evergreen Castles, and it was the first in the Peppermint Gang series of books that, that Ms. Clifford wrote, Laurie B. Clifford. I can't really remember what exactly spurred me to write to this author, but I suspect it was my mother. Um, I already knew how to write a proper letter because we had grown up across the country from my, where my grandparents lived. And my mother, who was a primary school teacher, made me include a page of my own writing in every letter that she sent to her parents, which was every couple of weeks, right? Because long distance calls were expensive. Dear Oma and Opa, this is me at like six or seven, right? How are you? I am fine. Heavily coached by my mother. How is the weather? <laughs> Here it is cold and the flowers are not open yet. I got second in track and field for triple jump, love, Sarah. This was the work of what felt like hours and hours on a Saturday afternoon with my hand cramping up around the pencil and the paper all wrinkled under my eraser. But in her reply, Oma would send me stickers for my sticker collection in, in with the letters that she sent to me, sometimes even a scratch and sniff sticker, sometimes even a googly-eyed puffy sticker. And so it was worth it, it was worth the effort. In fact, now that I'm looking back, these were probably my earliest lessons in the idea that there could be a payoff for putting pencil to paper, that the effort of writing could find recompense in the act of connecting with real live readers. It's probably best that royalties aren't, you know, book royalties aren't paid out in stickers. <laughs> but I actually think I'd be thrilled if once in a while I did receive some in an envelope. So I wrote to Lori B. Clifford, and of course I can't remember exactly what was included in my letter, but what matters is that she wrote back to me. Dear Sarah, thank you for your lovely letter. It came at a time when I needed encouragement. This summer I'm trying to build a house, write five books, and take care of my three kids. Right now it seems like a bit much. It turns out Laurie B. Clifford was an incredibly prolific middle grade, um, author of middle grade novels. She says in her reply that she likes my idea for a new Peppermint Gang story. I guess, <laughs> I guess I gave her some advice. She says maybe it will happen, but she can't promise because the books only take shape as she writes them. She says the series will have 12 books altogether, and she's going to dedicate one of the last six titles to me. Anyhow, here's the most important bit of her letter. I'm flattered that you appreciate my books because you write so well yourself. Praise from one writer to another means a lot. The Peppermint Gangs have more depth to them than most other juvenile books. Perhaps that's why your friends aren't as interested in them as you are. I'm enclosing the fourth Peppermint Gang book, dot, dot, dot. Praise from one writer to another. I honestly think this was the first moment that I understood that writer was something that I could maybe be when I grew up. I didn't understand, I don't think, before this moment that writing could be a vocation, that it could be a career like teacher or truck driver or mail carrier. I didn't have any writers in my life. I didn't think they were real somehow. <laughs> in my novel, in We Contain Multitudes, the English teacher who assigns the pen pal arrangement doesn't ever read the letters that her students are writing to each other. That's sort of part of the deal. But she does read an essay on Walt Whitman that one of the two main characters, whose name is Curl, 
writes using source material from the letters he's been exchanging for a couple of months with his younger pen pal, Joe. And after the teacher reads Curl's essay, she sort of singles him out and comes after him to express how impressed she is by his observations and by his writing ability. In fact, based on this piece of writing, she decides to put Curl's name forward for a special college entrance program and encourages him to apply to it. Curl has not meant to share anything or expose anything exceptional about himself, at least uh, he, he's not showing off in this essay or trying to win her recognition, at least not consciously or deliberately. But his writing gives him away. It shows her who he is, and she sees him and she responds. And this moment in the book proves to be a major turning point in Curl's life. It opens a door for him to a future he didn't foresee and hadn't imagined. The best part of writing my letter to the author, Curl's essay for class, his Whitman essay, is the part that we can't control or anticipate, but we yearn for the most, and it's the possibility that we will be seen. The second letter, the second love letter, was a love letter <laughs> that I wrote to the older brother of my friend Suzanne, Darren. This was in junior high, and I had been reading a lot of Jane Austen at the time, which is really not something that a 13-year-old should ever do if she wants to have an accurate picture of social relations in junior high. In Persuasion, the novel Persuasion, there's a famous, thrilling letter-writing moment. Frederick Wentworth is listening to our protagonist, Anne Elliot, at a party where she's opining to a group of people that men move on more quickly from heartbreak than women do. And the background here is that uh, 10 years earlier, when Anne was still a teenager, she and Frederick had been engaged, but her, her aunt convinced her, or we could say persuaded her, to um, call off the engagement because Frederick didn't have enough money. So fast forward 10 years later, Frederick is back in town. They're all in Bath, in the town of Bath, and uh, none, of the, none of the electricity between them has waned at all. Frederick goes over to a desk in the same room and sits down and starts writing a letter. Um, and it's, it's very dramatic to be doing that in real time in the scene. And then he slips her the letter and, oh my goodness, I can no longer listen in silence. I must speak to you by such means as are within my reach. You pierce my soul. I am half agony, half hope. Tell me not that I am too late, that such precious feelings are gone forever. I don't remember what my love letter to Darren contained exactly. I believe I might have written not that I had a crush on him or loved him, but that I admired him, which would have been something I'd stolen from Pride and Prejudice or any Jane Austen book, really. What I do remember is the visceral thrill of giving the envelope to Suzanne to give to her brother. It felt like stepping off a cliff into free fall or maybe launching into flight when you bear your soul in writing and then dispatch that piece of writing out into the real world, that's more than a verbal statement that you might make to someone. It's an act. It's a performative gesture of avowal and evidence. I mean, you put it in writing, right? And also, if it's a letter, your penmanship is such a personal reflection of you. Your signature reflects who you are. And if you've put a stamp on it, your saliva, your DNA is under that stamp, right? It's, 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 a, um, it's a bodily act. And its value emerges precisely at that moment when it becomes irrevocably out of your hands. The next day, boarding the school bus, Darren passed my seat, jabbed me really hard in the shoulder. Yo, doorknob, no more notes. Retrospect tells me that my epistolary overture was risky for Darren, too. No doubt his buddies ribbed him about it. The thing about a letter is that it implicates the person addressed as well as the writer. You know, historians can reconstruct the activities of famous personages, including the extramarital or otherwise illicit activities, not only from any incriminating letters they may have written, but also from letters sent to them. And even if, you know, that whole archive has been destroyed by relatives who want to, you know, for propriety's sake, hide the, 
a paper trail, the sender sometimes turns out to have made and kept their own copy before sending the letter. That was a thing people used to do to, to, for their own record keeping, copy it out and stick it in the file. Of course, I'd fantasized Darren replying to my letter. And looking back, I can see why he chose public verbal rejection instead. If he'd written back, even just to tell me what a dweeb I was, he would have been participating in some kind of an exchange with me. If we examine the economy of epistolarity, and you'll be happy to know that scholars have done this at length, a letter stands as the material trace of the social bond between two people, but it can also create and cement those bonds, those kind of social bonds. There's an understanding of reciprocity and turn-taking between letter writers, and it becomes a kind of tacit contract. So, you know, if someone's late with a reply or doesn't reply at all, they owe the other an explanation or an excuse or an apology. And, you know, you remember from letter writing days, people even do this with email, you know, apologies for the delay in this reply. So epistolarity isn't a market economy, but a gift economy of free exchange that nonetheless does involve a burden um, of obligation. There's one point, uh, sort of in the first third of We Contain Multitudes, at which Curl stops writing to Joe after their relationship has taken a sudden turn in the direction of sexual attraction. There's a series of letters that follow, um, that follows that Curl stops writing, um, from Joe, kind of sent out into a kind of void. Um, when he's in a, it's a kind of a cul-de-sac of epistolarity because Curl, out of fear, has cut off the circulation in their economy. And here is one of the ways that I think reading a novel can be a bit like receiving a letter, sometimes from someone you don't really want to hear from. You know, I say to my teenage son, oh, you're reading Miriam Taves, cool. And he kind of bristles and says, it's just for school. And anyway, it sucks. <laughs> and it's, it's like a novel, like a letter, makes a kind of a claim on you when you're reading it. It's a request for your attention and an imposition on your time. And even being faced with that request can be uncomfortable, depending on your, your age or your gender or maybe the precariousness of your social positioning or your sense of self. Teachers in the audience will probably know sort of what I'm talking about, right? You might have a few students who grasp any kind of new assigned texts eagerly and, and enthusiastically. I was one of those students, of course. <laughs> um, but there's others, maybe the majority, if we're talking about a high school English class, who look at it with great suspicion and even dread, right? An assigned novel or an assigned you know, book of short stories. And I really do think it's not only about, oh man, I have to read this instead of watching YouTube. I think it has to do with a kind of a dread of exposure, a feeling of vulnerability um, in the encounter with a, with a new story. And you can't predict what it's gonna ask of you as the reader. In response to this cruel rebuttal from my junior high school crutch, <clears throat> I started writing letters instead to Prince my favorite music artist. These were strange, embarrassing letters. They contained confessions that I couldn't write in my diary or my journal. I had three younger brothers. Confessions like, I don't think I really believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior anymore. And if I could have sex without anybody knowing, i.e. not with even the person I'm having sex with not knowing, I would do it with everyone in the school. <laughs> Strange, unacceptable letters, nonetheless written down and addressed to Prince. I also, I blamed Prince for all of these unacceptable thoughts, by the way, I kind of still do. His music made it impossible for me to think straight, neither straight as in rationally, nor straight as in straight and narrow. Sometimes I actually did post these letters to Prince. I addressed them to Prince Rogers Nelson, that's his name, Paisley Park, Minneapolis, Minnesota, but I never put a stamp on them and I never put a return address. I just put them in the mailbox. Sometimes I would hide the letters in library books that I was about to return. One time I recall slipping one into the pocket of a man's suit jacket on the rack in the department store. Um, yeah, I was, I was a real weirdo as a teenager. <laughs> And once I also have this very clear memory of deliberately dr letting a letter drop in its envelope while I was crossing the street and then turning around and watching as the, all the cars drove over it. 
and it sounds depressing, <laughs> but it was actually the opposite. It wasn't depressing. It made my heart pound in those moments. The letters sent to Prince, to nobody, made me feel powerful and triumphant and rebellious, even though the whole correspondence was just a private fantasy. I had some sense that my fictional Prince would not be shocked by my rebellious thoughts, that he wouldn't judge or disapprove, and maybe he'd even sympathize or egg me on in the direction of horniness or heresy or whatever the themes of the letters were, just like his songs egged me on in these directions. The unsent letter, the letter written with no hope of reply, can actually be a remarkably fruitful form. Think of Judy Bloom's novel, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Think of Alice Walker's The Color Purple. These are stories structured as prayers, sort of. Margaret and Seeley are addressing God in these novels, but really they're forms of confession, of self-narration and self-revelation, searching for answers addressed to a beloved, trusted interlocutor whom, as readers, we know isn't going to reply directly. Stephen Chabodsky's uh, novel, The Perks of Being a Wallflower, which was a, an inspiration for We Contain Multitudes, for sure. The narrator, Charlie, addresses his first-person narrative to an anonymous placeholder, dear friend. He structures it like a letter, but we never really find out who that friend is. And as readers encountering that story, we step very quickly and very naturally into the place of the compassionate friend receiving the story. Same with Ocean Vuong's celebrated 2019 novel, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. The narrator there frames the whole story as a letter to his mother, with the structural twist that his mother, as a Vietnamese refugee to the US, not only can't speak English, which is the language of the novel, but she's illiterate, she can't read at all. And again, as readers, we have this urge to sort of meet the narrator halfway and stand in for that absent or impossible addressee. Our compassion and empathy is very powerfully summoned and we're drawn into a very close identification with the narrator in these books. What was I doing writing letters to Prince? What is Ocean Vuong's young narrator doing writing a letter to his illiterate mother? Well, at a very basic developmental level, I would argue that what we're doing when we write like this is crafting a self. Some readers of We Contain Multitudes really aren't into its epistolary structure. They don't like it. And what they protest against is, I've had letters to this effect, email letters. What they protest against is the way Joe and Curl will replay events in their letters that they already lived through together in real life. When you said this, I was shocked and I wanted to say something, but just then my sister walked in, like kind of a, a blow by blow private commentary on what just happened. And it is artificial. And I can see how for some people it's annoying, but something else is happening in this recounting too. Joe and Curl are sort of renovating their everyday experience into something that becomes more spacious and creative. The epistolary isn't just a passive recap of what happens in real life. It never is. It's an imaginative and dynamic mode that participates in the forging of self and the forging of a shared reality. Developmental psychologists call this narrative identity formation. Letters, or I guess any form of keeping a diary or a blog or even posting music reviews would work in this context too. These are spaces where individuals identify with or distance from certain desires and values and decisions. This is called self-ascription. Basically, you're writing yourself into a story over time and thereby building up and thickening a sense of self. Through a, through a process of emplotment, Narrative self-interpretation integrates the different elements of one's life, actors, motives, places, circumstances, into a meaningful sense of being, establishing connections between one's character, one's reasons for action, one's emotional responses to experiences, and one's life contingencies. And so this ongoing self-narration builds a more robust sense of self. It builds resilience and self-awareness and maturity. And I just want to say, I don't believe that this type of self-building via writing is some special preserve of those of us whose mothers were primary school teachers and forced them to write letters to their grandparents. I think this is 
um, this idea of narrative self identification or self-development is vitally available to all of us in all stages of our lives. Although, of course, access to education and resources and literacy in the home, you know, makes a huge difference. Okay. On to love letter number three. <clears throat> so let's fast forward a couple of decades past my whole early adulthood, marriage, children, divorce, I had only been single again for four or five months when I met a man named Johan and we started dating. But I got cold feet. I perceived what I thought were similarities between this man and my ex-husband. And I thought that I must be falling into some kind of repetition compulsion, something unhealthy. And so just over two months of seeing him on and off, I broke up with him. And he expressed his regret, and we said goodbye. And I have to say, I was pretty miserable about, about it, even though it was my idea, the breakup. But I felt like I had taken the high road in some way, that I was standing on my own two feet, and that I would be a good, positive example of a strong, independent woman in some self-help manual of my own imagining. And then, a week or so later, I received a letter in my mailbox. No stamp, no address, just to Sarah, handwritten. Dear Sarah, as these grey winter days roll by, I can't help but wonder if you feel relief. Relief that you don't have to avert your eyes, to guard against me, hungry, reaching for your heart, to connect, to share what I know, who I am and what I fear. I remember the feeling caressing you, and here are some references to some private things between the two of us, which I am omitting, and he goes on, now it's the saddest time of the year. The long nights take their toll. Remind me of your absence. Wishing I could do and say the right thing. Assuage your fears. Drag you from your past to a new way. A way of new places, ideas, and possibilities. Wishing I could do that. You are in my heart and soul. Johan. Remember, we'd only been dating for 11 weeks. So yeah, this is some pretty high-flying rhetoric in this letter, right? And I wonder, looking back, what made this love letter so special and so extremely effective? Because, I mean, partly it's hindsight. Johan and I are still together seven years later. So there is some poignancy in the fact of the sheer sort of predictive power of his, of his letter here. I mean, he was right. Being together was, in fact, a great idea. But also, this narrative artifact, I think, managed to strike a balance between declaration and demand meaning it was all declaration and no demand, no bargaining or promises, no, you're being unfair, you know, give me a better explanation or give me one more chance. It was just wishing and yearning expressed in that letter. And there was a kind of purity to it, right? A kind of selflessness. In fact, Johann's letter sits squarely in the tradition of what are known as post-mortem love letters in literature, written or received after the lovers have parted ways or sometimes even more dramatically, after the death of one or both of them. One of my all-time favorites is from Michael Ondaatje's 1992 Booker Award-winning novel, The English Patient, fellow Canadian writer. After the plane goes down and Catherine is badly injured, Almaji leaves her lying, in, he's her lover, leaves her lying in a desert cave and tries to go for help. And in the book, he gets tragically waylaid and she passes away, she dies. For the movie version, for which Ondaatje wrote the screenplay, and I believe it won some Academy Awards as well, um, he rearranged some passages from the novel to give Catherine a final speech in the form of a letter to Almaji that she writes after he's left. And in the cave, he's left her a torch and, note, and a notebook and a pen. And what she writes is essentially a philosophy of desire, of love. And I wish I could play you the scene because it's especially moving with the sad piano soundtrack happening over, over her, behind her voice. My darling, the fire is gone now and I'm horribly cold. I'm afraid I waste the light on writing these words. We die rich with lovers and tribes, tastes we have swallowed, bodies we have entered and swum up like rivers, fears we've hidden in like this wretched cave I know you will come carry me out into the palace of winds. That's what they call the desert. That's all I wanted, 
to walk in such a place with you, an earth without maps. The lamp's gone out now, I'm writing in the darkness. <sighs> I think I was inspired by some buried memory of this film, of this letter. And also maybe I was inspired by Johann's love letter when I was writing We Contain Multitudes because I was writing a first draft of the novel at that time, years ago, at that time of our brief breakup and reunion. Since We Contain Multitudes is comprised entirely of letters, I needed to do something special to set apart Curl's post-mortem letter to Joe. And don't worry, neither of them dies in the book. I mean post-mortem on the relationship, like Johann's letter to me. So in order to make it special, instead of a letter, Curl writes a poem to Joe, which he leaves with him when it's goodbye for the last time. It's called Green. From the start, you saw the truth of me grown slowly up out of the dark, a pale green thing reaching for the sun. Like a mirror, you showed me to myself all bluster and scars. I was uneasy with the reflection and moved away, but you pulled me back and back again. Before you, I never noticed daybreak, crimson, then yellow, then white. I never saw how the clouds rush the sky. I never knew how soft the skin is behind a knee, how skin can smell like milk, like grass, like the sea. I never noticed how an ant will climb to the tip of a blade of grass for no reason, how many things happen for no reason, and how no reason can mean joy. This letter from Curl stands out because, again, there's no demand in it. There's no request. It's just an expression of love. It's just gratitude mixed with grief. It's a love letter, pure and simple. And, spoiler alert, like Johann's letter to me, Curl's poem changes Joe's mind. The other convincing thing about the love letter Johann wrote to me was its gesture as a material artifact. He was making a significant gesture. How so? Well, on one of our very early dates, I confessed to Johann that I hated texting and that, to be honest, I wasn't a big fan of phone calls either. How would you like to be communicated with? <laughs> and I said, letters. And then I went, ha ha ha, thinking, wow, Sarah, could you be any more of a nerd? This guy's never going to call you again. And of course, we weren't going to write letters. We texted and we talked on the phone all the time. But when it came time for a declaration, when Johann really wanted to tell me how he felt and really wanted to make sure that I heard him, he wrote it out in a letter and he dropped it into my mailbox. And following through on that jokey wish, that early wish of mine for an old fashioned letter writing proved something to me. It proved that Johann saw me and that he was willing to go out of his way to make my wishes come true, no matter how silly or anachronistic they, they are. When a character in a novel posts a letter, it becomes what's known as a significant object in that, in that text, in that story. You've heard of Chekhov's gun, right? If you mentioned in chapter one that there's a gun hanging on the wall, then by chapter two or three, that gun had better go off. Otherwise, what is that gun doing in, in that novel, right? That's a significant object. So I knew from the start that the letters between Joe and Curl had to do something in the wider world of, their sto of the story. The cliche in epistolary fiction is that a letter falls into the wrong hands. And this does happen once in an early scene and it results in Joe being taunted and Curl losing his temper. And again, more seriously, it happens when Curl's abusive stepfather reads one of these love letters and, and kicks Curl out of the house. It's much more serious. But also a broader, kind of more metafictional event happens too, which is that Joe bundles up all of Curl's correspondence, all of his side of the correspondence, and sends it off to the college program to serve as Curl's ace, his autobiographical creative essay that he's supposed to submit with his application, and which Curl has decided not to write. He's decided he can't go to college due to the chaos and violence of his life at home. And in this turn of events, the letters travel way past their original intended, re intended recipient to become a turn in the plot. This engineering was some sheer writerly fun on my part to have the letters be and mean as many things as possible. A private exchange, a bid for Curl's 
post-secondary future, and then also the novel that you're holding in your hands. There's something very paradoxical in this, and also I think very cool, the way a piece of writing can be something deeply private and intimate, and somehow also can accrue meaning for a much wider readership. It's paradoxical because I don't think that the public, the public collective reading changes or cancels out the private intimate meaning at all. Somehow the private and the public can exist together in a kind of a beautiful uh, fusion. On each end of the epistolary exchange is solitude and privacy, right? Those are the normative or preferred conditions for writing a letter, just so you can concentrate. And also those are the conditions for reading a letter, right? If you receive a piece of correspondence that you care about, you tuck it away for later when you can enjoy it more privately. And this is exactly the same with a novel. Sure, we have book clubs and bookstagram and Goodreads and Vermont Reads reading program, but reading a novel is still, first and foremost, an intimate experience. It's done in private. A novel is so special this way. On the one hand, novels are all about dialogue and exchange. A novel is an inherently dialogic genre, meaning it embraces a wide variety of voices in its pages, whether via dialogue proper, between characters, or shifting narrative point of view, or the inclusion of things like diary entries, ransom notes, philosophical ruminations, political asides. And for this reason, some theorists, like Mikhail Bakhtin famously, claim that the novel is inherently resistant to totalitarian and authoritarian politics. And this is why novelists under totalitarian regimes are often censored and sometimes exiled. In this view, the novel as a genre, as a form, has democracy baked into it, a clamor of voices without any one voice being allowed to prevail definitively over the other voices. And yet, at the end of the day, a novel in the act of being read can only reach out to one reader at a time. Or I guess maybe two if you're reading aloud or a teacher's reading to a class, it can be more. All of the voices in a novel, all of its clamorous life is folded up and posted to you, the reader, in a private, intimate experience of reading it, of spending time with it and deciding what you think. Author Zadie Smith writes about the sort of peak experience of feeling, oh sorry, she writes about a peak experience for her of feeling seen by a novel that she's read, feeling personally known by it in a profound way. In her essay, In Defense of Fiction, she challenges readers not to get too caught up in internet campaigns about who should be allowed to write what kind of book and which books should be rejected out of hand for not following the rules. Smith says that a novel will either get it right, in which case you will feel it with your whole being when it does, you will feel seen and known by that book, or it will get it wrong and you'll know that too. But you, as the individual reader encountering that book, is the one who has to decide. At its very best, a novel will serve not as a portrait or like a landscape painting on the wall portraying a particular way of life to us, but rather as a temporary doorway into that way of life. A good novel invites us to step through its portal and to think and feel with its characters, to experience with them and empathize with them. It goes without saying that a lot of novels don't succeed at this. The failure turns out to have less to do with the author's identity or life experience or the time period they're writing in or the amount of research that goes into the story. And it has more to do with language itself at the micro level of the sentence, the rhythm from one sentence to the next. You know, a writer can have the best of intentions. She can aim at a compassionate, inclusive portrayal and end up in cliché and stereotype and tired plot structure and didactic themes and pat endings. And the failure comes down to a failure of the writer's craft of language. This is the fear that really keeps me up at night, right? Or, or stops me in my tracks in the middle of a second draft of a book. Is this terrible? This is terrible. This is a failure. Like writing a love letter to a high school crush, the dread of rejection, of failure, is outweighed only by the urgency that comes from somewhere deep inside to connect, to take that risk. 
one last love letter. This is from a year ago to me via email from a stranger, from a reader who has given me permission to share his words with you and whose privacy I'm going to protect by changing his name to Brian. Dear little Joe, the letter begins, I wanted to thank you for being such a multi-layered character and thank your author Sarah Henstra for depicting you in such a caring way. I was, as you called yourself, a boring, scrawny little gay kid like you in high school, although I wasn't as brave as you in my fashion style. I'm even prone to crying easily like you. I wish my 16-year-old self had had a book like yours to give me courage and hope when I lacked relatability with others my own age. I was picked on all the time, too, but I never thought I warranted the kind of attention that Curl gives to you once he starts to notice how unique you are and what makes you tick. I love all the little epiphanies both of you have along the way. Not to mention someone writing a whole novel about you and being understood from the inside out. Your book allowed me to go back and feel the things I felt then and somehow remember myself as less alone. So thank you for being your beautiful self, Joe, and for giving kids like me in my former days someone to connect to. With admiration and love from Brian. I just, I still just don't fully know what to say about this letter. Brian identified with Joe so closely and so personally that he reaches out to him, to Joe, in gratitude. And there's this gorgeous time travel happening here where it's Brian on behalf of his lonely teenage self who's reaching out in gratitude. And as for me, the author, I'm being addressed tangentially in this letter via a character that I, I made up, right? In a story that I made up. It's, it makes me dizzy thinking about it. And I, I'm being reassured that for this one reader, at least, an act of compassion and connection has taken place. Every novel is a love letter addressed to its readers. When that love is received and felt and shared and reciprocated, well, what more could a writer ever hope for? Thank you.